You know, it's always it's always a good excuse. What's that? It's not an excuse, I agree. And it's not a big deal in Washington, but here in California, sometimes it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it's always a good Bible study when you can work in, you know, a Will Ferrell quote on the cover, you know. I don't know if that's ever been done before. We're, we're breaking new ground here. Um, but obviously, as you probably figured out with the song there, we're talking about pride this morning. And you notice as you read those lyrics, it's kind of this natural progression. And it's a progression that I think we all have to go through before we even become a Christian, right? It's like, before we become a Christian, it's all of self and none of thee. And then we slowly, as we realize that Christ is the Son of God, and he died for our sins, and it becomes all of thee and none of self. And, and we make that progression. And yet, even as Christians, we struggle with pride. Um, you know, I, I just want to start off and ask a question before we get into kind of my article too, real quick. There are so many different directions that this study could go because of how many different verses you have on the subject of pride. But are there any uh, immediate verses that come to mind? If, or maybe you don't remember where it's at exactly, but are there any immediate uh, words of the Bible that come to mind concerning pride? pride goes yeah, before the pride goes before the fall, right? I have that one. That's Proverbs sixteen eighteen, right? At the bottom there, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Uh, anybody else? One of the avenues of temptation, First John 2, the pride of life. Yes. Being the Lord. Yeah, pride Paradise. of life is getting sucked into this life and all the accomplishments that you can set out to achieve and forgetting completely about God. Uh, that's definitely a temptation. Anybody else? Uh, kind of on the front cover here, you'll notice... That Jesus kind of gives this exhortation, and I think it deals directly with pride. It says, The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But this whole idea is the greatest among you shall be your servant. Uh, I mean, that's, that must have been mind blowing at the time as you're thinking about the, the scribes and the, the Pharisees and how they kind of lorded their righteousness over other individuals. And yet here Jesus is teaching his disciples that the greatest among you is going to serve. In other words, in order to be great, you really have to be humble, <laughs> don't you? And how exactly does that work? Um, but just kind of think about this idea, too. Uh, any, any other comments before we move on? No? Okay. Uh, I don't think it's any secret that us men, in particular, I think pride is a, is a temptation that women can struggle with as well, but I think it's one that men particularly struggle with. Is there any ideas as to why that is? Anybody have any, any, uh, any thoughts on that? Well, if you're supposed to be physically stronger, you just automatically think that you're going to be stronger all around. And, uh, <coughs> also, uh, the idea of taking care of uh, either your wife or uh, females and things mm -hmm. like that. There's, it, I think a lot of it has to do with stereotypes, too. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, the whole idea is that you know, that's really... Yeah, and sometimes it kind of becomes, uh, we get carried away with it, with that responsibility that we've been getting to take care of our wives. And then we take, you know, that statement that Paul gives to the Ephesians that, that Christ is the, the head of the, the woman. And we, we go crazy with that. We right, well, the, the monogenous type of attitude that uh, some men have yeah, definitely can go too far. Yeah, absolutely. Ron? You, said it, you, you said it right after he, he, it was responsibility, basically, for it's, it, it come, it, it, the pride comes from. It gets yeah. to. I mean, that, that's we have a huge responsibility as a father, as a dad, and sometimes as a leader in a congregation. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. Dave, as I say, uh, we're men. We we see it across the United States, social media, from growing up from our friends. We're supposed to know how to do everything. We're supposed to know how to fix everything. Yeah. Just for being a dad, like I can fix the smallest, simplest toy with some glue, and then all of a sudden I'm a you know. I'm an astronaut, or I'm a rocket scientist, or I'm, I'm this huge hero to them. And it's funny because it's like, okay, you know, I want to be that for my kids. Mm -hmm. But we get this in our back of our head. There's some things that sometimes that you have to tell your kids, um, I, I don't know how to do that. I kind of be humble because otherwise we're going to make it worse. But growing up, we always see that men are supposed to be in charge. We're supposed to do this, yeah. we're supposed to do that. That's just not. Well, you got the classic TV dad who, you know, he comes home with some complicated yeah. thing that he's supposed to put together. It's like, oh, the instructions, you don't need the instructions, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's not okay. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, any, any, oh, uh, no, it's kind of funny that you mentioned the instructions because I was thinking about the commercial. It's kind of a newer one. Uh, and it's, it's a 
about the, I think it's like the uh, Google portal or whatever, where you can talk, it's almost like FaceTime. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, the, and the, the younger dad is calling his dad, you know, and saying, he's trying to put together either a dollhouse or something. He says, oh, you have the instructions. Well, how much time do you have? He says, oh, she'll be up in about 20 minutes, mm -hmm. you know? And of course, he hasn't even put anything together. So I, I think of that as like, oh yeah, being able to handle anything. Yeah. The other thing I thought of too is how men, you know, uh, there's this common thing of, of not asking for directions, right? Oh, yeah. we, know, we know our way. And the thing about it is it really brings it into perspective when you look at spiritually, not asking for directions. Well, if we're not asking for directions and not following the directions of which we have in the Bible, obviously that's where we're really going to get in trouble. Yeah. Because not only is it going to affect us, but it's going to affect our family too if we're not seeking and asking for those directions, mm -hmm. which is in Scripture. So basically what I'm getting from all this is that the root of all this there's this expectation for men. Maybe it's an expectation that's put on us by others, by society, or maybe it's sometimes an expectation we put on ourselves that we're supposed to just automatically know how to do everything. That we're supposed to know how to put together, you know, whatever, the bed frame we bought from Ikea. We're supposed to know how to get to our destination. I mean, I remember uh, one of the most worst dates I've ever been on in my life. I took a girl in downtown, to downtown Seattle to go watch a soccer game. It was so embarrassing because she knew her way around the city better than I did. And I was just, <laughs> I was humiliated. I didn't go on a second date with her. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, yeah, there's this expectation. Where does that lead spiritually? That we think in our minds, oh, I'm supposed to know what to do. I can't rely on anybody else but me. And we can see how that can become dangerous. It's, we're supposed to rely on God, rely on his word to direct our feet. Yeah. In the time I think about this subject, Think of Deuteronomy 8, where Jesus warns, I mean, where God warns us okay. in verse 17, where he says, Other way, otherwise you may say in your heart, My power, my strength, and my hand made this wealth. Yeah. So it, it, it seems to be from the time that you know, we're told we're going to have to work on the sweat of our brow that there's a tendency uh, that when the day is accomplished, we, we accomplish that. Like we're our own, own God, God, basically. Our own talent. Yeah. Uh, Matt, you're going to say something. You had your hand up. Yeah, I, I, just, I don't know if I necessarily would, would say that that men struggle with pride more so than mm -hmm. women. Yeah. I think that it it our pride, the way that it portrays itself, is very different mm -hmm. than women. I, mean, I think that women probably there's ex we're talking about expectations. The same thing applies with women. It's just different. Mm -hmm. But I think that if men were naturally more prideful <coughs> than women. Starting all the fights, right? Yeah. But, and we'd be winning them all as well, right? Yeah. So, yeah. But it, I mean, anytime, I'm just using that as an example. Yeah. Anytime there's any kind of domestic argument, it goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. Usually that's, that stems from pride. Yeah, because, very true. Because both people are guilty of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think women and men both struggle with it, but I think that it just shows itself in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Brett. Well, that's where I was going to go with this because yeah. um, I think it is different because we go back. Pete takes us to Deuteronomy 8, and that's a great example. Mm -hmm. But we need only go back to Genesis 3, and the devil uses all three avenues of sin, <laughs> one of them being the five life, and who was that they gave into it to Eve. begin with? Yeah, it was Eve. Oh, yeah. A woman was, was Eve's, and you shall be wise like God, and, and she succumbed to that. And I think what we find across the board, men and women, and I realize we're trying to make applications, and there's this whole alpha male thing. We, yeah. we get that. We get that. But... Uh, the point is, is one of the things is we don't have, no one likes to admit that they've been wrong about something. Yeah. That's a bitter pill to swallow. That brings about the pride. And that crosses the genders. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference. Because we see Eve, and then how do you, and then we're going to see Adam, and then even when we see Cain, mm -hmm. what's he doing? I mean, where's your brother and all this kind of thing? And, and, and we just see how that's associated. Yeah. It's from time beginning. Pride is an issue mm -hmm. from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. They're just saying that pride is the root of all evil. I think it's one of the seven deadly sins or whatever that whoever wrote that book. But yeah, I know I, I agree with all that. Um, any other comments or questions before we kind of get into the article here? So uh, I'm just kind of looking particularly at men here too. Um, but yeah, so I kind of just dedicated kind of the first two paragraphs to this question. But obviously, when man was created, he was charged to rule over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the livestock, and all wild animals, as well as all the creatures that move along the ground. 
The psalmist says in man, you make him to rule over the works of your hands, you put all things under his feet. Psalm 8 6. Even today, under the new covenant that God has made with man, the man is identified as being the head of his household in Ephesians 5 23. And it's also responsible for leadership within the congregation and organized worship. Uh, obviously, women can lead too, but in different ways. Uh, we don't see that in organized worship, but there certainly is a need for, for you know, feminine leaders within the church. Yes, exactly, exactly. So that's obviously not my intention there. Uh, but as we observe all these various responsibilities that man has been given by God today, it probably goes without saying that pride is a struggle with which man is well acquainted. That's why Paul also tells man to love his wife so as to prevent one from being an insensitive dictator within the home. But what about when Peter says of the elders in the church, be shepherds of God's flock that is among you, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. 1 Peter 5, verses 2 and 3. This is not a warning against the temptation of becoming puffed up in our leadership positions, specifically elders in this case, but I think that's something that can take place in any position of leadership. Uh, I mean, even if, as we were just talking about, you know, women leaders in the church, they can just as easily um, become puffed up. We've seen, I think, we've all experienced uh, perhaps elders' wives over the years <laughs> lording that, that type of position over other individuals as well as men. We've seen real examples of that, or at least I have. Um, yeah. Uh, so these are just a couple of examples where we see inspired men, inspired men giving commands in an event to prevent one from be, becoming uh, prideful. So we look at this idea of having responsibility uh, for leadership. And so I guess my question right here is how can we, and maybe this is a question for the elders too, because I feel they do a great job of this, this here. Um, but how can we lead humbly? Because here we are often put in leadership positions, men are, uh, and you even look within your own homes, many of you have family. Uh, how can we lead humbly without becoming arrogant with that role of responsibility? Clint. Oh, sorry, I didn't see your hand. Clint, oh, Hoyt, go ahead, Hoyt, sorry. He's just right in front of me. You were first, I was just thinking of Christ humbling himself before his apostles and washing their feet, mm. talking about greatest man that ever lived, but humbling himself, talk about no pride at all. Seriously. And we need to think about that as leaders of the church. Yeah. We need to humble ourselves. And, and, uh, and I think when you do that, too, you have more respect. Yes. And, and the thing that's significant about Christ is, and I brought this up in a sermon not too long ago, but, <coughs> I mean, could any of us have faulted Christ if he were proud? <laughs> you know, he's the one that has kind of the right to be proud and yet he humbled. He humbled himself, exactly, to the point of obedience, to the point he was willing to die for man. Uh, but yeah, Clint? You'd mentioned in the introduction, <laughs> you'd mentioned in the introduction, number one, that, you know, to be a, a, a leader, you have to be humble yeah. at some, some point in time. And to think of Christ in what, obviously being the Son of God and coming down from heaven and making himself as low as a man to have to go through what he had to. That's, I mean, that takes humility yeah. because it's this leadership role that now you're taking and you're going down uh, several pegs. Well, he subjects himself to man who is infinitely lower than yes. he is. I mean, that's humility. And then the, the second thing I was thinking about, too, is, is you know, a lot of times uh, we, we think ourselves wise and when we're not. In our own and eyes. even yeah. as, you know, uh, it states in Proverbs, you know, Proverbs third chapter is talking about not being wise in your own eyes, mm -hmm. but you know, look to the wisdom of God; and He'll make your path straight. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if we if we think that we're wise in our own eyes and that we can handle anything, then that's that's where we do kind of uh, get in trouble. Yeah, we need to just check on ourselves. Yes, check yourself before you wreck yourself. That's right. Yeah. Good. Well, Paul warned that knowledge puffs up. Oh yeah. And so what happens is that. We, uh, and especially we see the context, as you said, in 1 Peter 5, as it's addressing primarily the elders there, while there are going to be some corollaries to that. But the point is, is that it's all about demeanor then, because you may have a lot of knowledge and you may have a lot of experience <coughs> and a lot of success and achievement in various ways, but then it's always coming down to that attitude. How am I going to convey that? How am I going to share that? And if I do it in a condescending way, where I elevate myself and speak down to others, then that's obviously a demonstration of pride, and then it 
total loss of respect mm -hmm. by a lot of folks. Yeah. And so we have to be careful that when we are become achievers or successful or whatever it might be, and whatever we do in this life, uh, you know what, we just gotta keep ourselves ourselves lower yeah. as Jesus did. And maybe the attitude problem is we, we sometimes look at these leadership positions as, you know, what can it do for me? But what we need to do is look at these leadership positions and see, okay, how this is an opportunity to serve. How can I use this leadership position to serve? I mean, isn't that what Christ did? I mean, he's in this, this uh, ultimate position of leadership, right. and yet he came to serve. Um, yeah. John? I think when we often hear the story of a successful man, and, and I started you know, being barefoot on the farm. Mm -hmm. And I did this, and I did that, and I did that, and I did that, and today I am. And in that pride of, you know, I am successful because I am. Mm -hmm. But Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Mm -hmm. And so whatever we have is not I. Mm -hmm. It was achieved if we have the love of Christ in our hearts, and we use the talents that he's given us then we have achieved that because of Christ and not because of I. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the problem with mankind, is they like to be important. Mm -hmm. uh, they seem to strive. I was sharing with some brethren last night an advert we had on our TV in South Africa. This young man comes in the airport to the information counter and there's been some mix up with his flight and he's talking to the young lady behind the counter. And she's saying to him, well, look, the, you know, it's not bad. And he loses his school and he says, do you know who I am? <laughs> and she picks up the last speaker and she announces, I have a young man here who doesn't know who he is. Can somebody please come and identify him? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And, and, and so the I is, is, I think it's part of mankind pride. Mm -hmm. But it's like everything else, we've got to control it. And it's, you mentioned this year, it's not always wrong to have pride. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of my children. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of them because they're good Christians and they're faithful Christians. Mm -hmm. But it's not for any glory to me or my wife. Mm -hmm. It's a glory to God mm -hmm. that they accepted the gospel and that they... But yeah. that's a, a positive pride. Yeah. I'm proud to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud to be a member of a congregation that I'm with. Yeah. No, yeah, and that's when you, I think you get into, there's different connotations when we use the word pride. Yeah. Um, any other comments? Pete, yeah. I think it's uh, <clears throat> when, you, when you lay uh, the second chapter of Philippians next to John 13, which is the two parallel passages about uh, humbling, <clears throat> it really boils down to an esteem issue, right? It's an esteem issue. It's you are lowering yourself providing you serve, you're serving somebody that either economically, socially, whatever, is in a different position than you are, but the, the mechanism that allows you to do that is, is as Christ demonstrated, is you know who you are, right? So there's a meekness involved. You're withholding something back that you have the perfect right to use, but you hold that back when you serve that person in a capacity that they need at that point in time. And as Philippians 2 says, the reason Jesus was able to do that is because, first of all, he knew where it came from and he knew where he was going. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the aggrandizement is not from that act or the reward is not from that act of serving, hey, look what I did. It's more that you're serving the Father mm -hmm. and, and, and the ultimate reward is that. Yeah, no ultimate So when it comes to serving our children, our wife, our Employees, whatever the case may be, it's not a matter of uh, you know this meek, cowering person. Right. But it's more of a person that's in complete, 100% control, knows exactly what they're doing and why, and what that person needs at that point in time, irrespective of whatever the people think of that person at that point in time. Yeah. That person has a esteem. He knows where he's going. Yeah, I think meekness is defined in some lexicons that Greek yeah. word forget the word, but power under control. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that's the idea. Yeah. Two great examples of that: <coughs> Moses and John the Baptist. Numbers twelve three says that now Moses was the meekest man upon the 
day out here. And yet we don't see weakness in his meekness. We see strength and submission, power and control. I think the other great example is John the Baptist. Jesus said of John the Baptist, of men, prophets, born of women, none greater than John, right? Mm -hmm. And yet John was very satisfied with who he was from the standpoint of his position to God, his relationship. And he knew that he was preparing the way for Christ. And I love his statement in John 3.30, when he's looking at Jesus at a, just a near distance away with, among his own disciples. And he says, for he must increase and I must decrease. Mm -hmm. And when we are satisfied with who we are and what the Lord's going to use us for in this life. And you know what? It goes back to what John was saying. It's not about me or not about having an eye problem, but it's about it's about glory to God. Yeah, and it's almost to just what you're saying kind of reminds me of what Paul tells Timothy that godliness with contentment is great gain. I mean, yeah. Yep. So uh, any anything else? Okay. Uh, let's read the next paragraph here. <clears throat> Third paragraph though. Uh, pride is not only something that can hinder man's ability to lead his family in the local congregation, but it is also something that will hinder our ability to be Christians. <clears throat> the Christian life is one that starts with humility. And this humility is something that is to remain constant in our lives until the day we die. Now, would anybody disagree with that? Uh, this is why Peter writes, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. In other words, it's like the spiritual garment that's supposed, that we're supposed to be wearing at all times, and so I have a. I know we're kind of maybe jumping down here on the questions, but I don't really mind if, uh, if we don't get through all these questions. I'm not really that upset about it. Um, but let's see here. Just uh, directly across there, it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven down. Uh, what does it mean, and what are the implications of Peter's statement when he tells us to clothe ourselves with humility? What do you guys make of that statement? To me, I mean, if you ever study the word nakedness in the Old Testament, you realize that it's like, it's always something that's shameful. Um, and so here, Peter writes and tells us, tells the Christians that he's writing to, to clothe themselves with humility. And so if you don't have humility, then what are you? You're naked, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and so in other words, I think that Maybe what Peter's getting at here is that, and maybe this is a, an, an inference that I'm making, but to have pride, and, that, and obviously we're not talking about the type of pride that like John was referring to, but to have this pride where we're puffed up, where we're arrogant, that's an extremely shameful thing. Um, and without humility, we're naked. Yeah. Romans 12, 3 says, Well, I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, mm -hmm. but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Mm -hmm. And I think that, sorry for you. Yeah, and of course we're also told to uh, consider others better than we are. Yes, in Philippians 2. Yeah, Philippians 2, 3. That takes some humility. Yeah, exactly. And so I guess, you know, since, since Peter is saying essentially that you're naked without humility, um, what is it about pride that makes us inadequate to serve God. Because we're showing the wrong thing. Yeah. The, the, the thing is, with, with clothes or such humility, I think the metaphor that Peter's really emphasizing there, as I look at the passage, yeah. is that we all, when we all come walking in, what's the first, you know, what's really kind of the first thing we notice about each other? When we <laughs> first aware. walk in to see each other. I mean, we, 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 we look in and I've got to read Jason's t-shirt, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's coming in and I'm going, what is this? But anyway. But you have to decide. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the thing is because it's what's, it's what's visible. It's what's what seen. Yeah. If we don't clothe ourselves with humility, I think he's dealing with contrast. Yes. If we're not clothed with humility, what do we clothe with? Pride. Yeah. Pride. Yeah. So I, I think that's the metaphor that he's yeah. really showing. That's why we put on the Lord Jesus because if we don't clothe ourselves with Christ... Then we're clothed with who? The opposite. Say, yeah. 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 Anyway. Dave? We're well, just kind of going off what Brett said. Um, I looked up just to see what the internet would define humility as. And it says that he needs the humility to accept that their way, that their way may be better. Um, that there's a better way to be better. So I think as a Christian, in order to start being a Christian, we have to be humble and know that 
God's way is better. We need to be humble about that. And that's why we need to accept God first, right? We need to believe his word. Um, and obviously, if we're not humble about it and we think our way is the right way, then that's not the right way to start our Christian life. So yeah. we kind of talk about like clothing ourselves with humility to start as a Christian and obviously throughout our Christianity. Mm-hmm. I think it's a little bit different, too, biblically and socially. Yes. Right. Totally. Definitely. Totally different. Yeah, it's two different connotations. And, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you were saying that the Christian... Um, and as Brent said, we all look and see what are we wearing, and that's what the people of the world are going to see too, how we're acting, and there goes our influence right there. If they see somebody you know, acting that way, um, you're talking about leadership too. I remember it was a few years ago they had a, a radio program uh, from Hearst Castle, a local radio program, talking to the local talk show, and they had Void on there, and uh, they had one of his subordinates who was upper management as well. But but he mentioned that when the reason everybody likes working for Hoyt up there is because Hoyt's not going to ask you to do something up there that he hasn't done himself mm-hmm. and that he doesn't know everything about already. And and really, uh, that's how you, you go about your business is what people see. And that's what's going to help you be a good leader help you to have influence over others and all those things. And the other thing is we <coughs> we need to constantly check ourselves. Yeah. Because no matter what, we live in a country that the things that we have each and every day that we often take for granted and then we start thinking to ourselves, well, we get this, we get that, and you gotta stop and constantly every day. And this is you know, you're not that set the hot stuff. No. And so it really is something that we need to be ready to, to battle in our within ourselves every day. Yeah. Well, and just going along with what you're saying, too, we already looked at 1 Peter 5 when he says to the elders, you know, don't lord that over them. But what's the next thing he says to the, the elders? The example. The example. Yeah. Exactly. And so show them so how we have the best example yeah. of the one who sets anything. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Cliff, yeah. So, Talking about being clothed in humility, I think of when we're clothed, obviously we talked about how it's being naked. When you're naked, you, you become vulnerable. And the thing I think about is what are we vulnerable to? Obviously, we're vulnerable to the schemes of Satan. We're vulnerable to being opened up to something which obviously is going to affect our spirituality. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, just kind of going along with what he's saying, like being clothed with humility, it kind of does give us this... Um, Protection because there's there's a lot of other things that we have there's a lot of other things that we have too that we clothe ourselves with if it's um, you know if it's something to the effect of of clothing ourselves obviously we have the full armor of God that yeah. you know we, we put on as well but I just think of the the vulnerability aspect of if we if we don't have something on yes we are naked and then we're opened up we're being exposed to something by regards of uh, Satan right. But uh, I guess one of the reasons to uh, why I was thinking about uh, you know inadequacy and how pride kind of renders us inadequate to properly serve God is because I think that that's really true. As you observe the scriptures, you look at all the different things that are required for a Christian, and you think, well, how in the world can I do that uh, if, if if I'm puffed up, if I'm prideful? Going back to what John Stoltz said, you know, Philippians two verse three. Uh, you maybe just want to turn over there, actually. Uh, But we'll just start in verse 1. It says, Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility, mind. Uh, with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. How in the world can we consider one another when all that we're concerned about is ourselves? Not only that, you look at this passage and it's in the context of unity. How can unity be achieved when all of us are just puffed up with pride and we're just looking out for our own interests? Uh, not only does, does pride hinder us from becoming Christians, I mean, what do you, what's one of the first things you have to do? You have to confess that you're a sinner, right? And you have to acknowledge that the old man needs to be put to death. That takes humility to do that. Uh, not only does it hinder us from becoming Christians and maintaining, you know, our sonship in Christ, 
but it also it threatens the church because we've all seen instances within the church where you get a pride for personality and you see all the dissension that can occur because of that and all the problems you can have because of that. Yeah, wait. We also need to be careful of how we address and how we deal with those are, that are without, that are visiting with us, that are unfamiliar with uh, our teaching, the mm-hmm. teaching of God's Word, and how we convey that to them. I yeah. have seen it to where a person says, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can't, you can't start out that way. That's, but I've seen that. Yeah. So we have to be very, very careful uh, in dealing with those that are coming to visit us for the first time and, uh, you know, be gentle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, when you correct somebody and you're leading with arrogance, you're making it extremely difficult for the person to acknowledge their wrongdoing. Right. Even if the point you're making is right. But how many of us have been in that situation where somebody's just telling us, hey, you know, you're wrong. Uh, and they're, but they're being a, a jerk about it, you know. I mean, how many of us are going, hey, you know what, yeah, you're right, I am wrong. <laughs> we, all, we all want to defend ourselves. That's our, our first yeah. instinct, John. When I was a very young Christian, I started talking to a, a friend of mine about the Lord, but my knowledge was limited, and so I asked an older brother, brother to come with me. And this young man had asked him, he's passed or whatever, was it to be the well, it was quite eventful. But ask about the event at church the Sunday. The reply of the older brother was exactly this. He said, boy, did I pin that guy's ears to the wall. <laughs> Is that what we were there for? Mm-hmm. To pin his ears to the wall, you know, and taking pride in that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what, what the point is saying. Yeah. You know, we, we would have been no. so, so humble in that, that will win people over. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, will win people over. Is it not I, I like to, whenever I discuss with people, I always say, what do you think this passage is saying? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, oh no, well, you're wrong, that's not what that passage is. What do you think it's in? And then coming back with the Bible answer of what you believe that passage says. And, and that's an approach that I found successful, mm-hmm. rather than one of... Uh, being dogmatic, you know. Yeah. Well, oh, no, you put it all wrong, my friend. Let me show you the right way, you know. Yeah, and that's true in, like, every aspect of life. I mean, how many of us like serving, uh, you know, working for a boss who is just super arrogant? None of us, none of us like to go the extra mile for that guy. But when it's somebody that's humble, when it's somebody who's willing to, like Tim was saying, pitch in and do the work that they're asking you to do, I mean, all of us are willing to go the extra mile for that individual. And it works the same way in our, in our spiritual lives as well. You know, if you're bringing somebody to the gospel with humility, uh, then I think that you're going to have a, a better chance of having an impact on them and maybe rubbing off on them. It's a good example. I like that. Yeah. Uh, Tim? I don't want to get too far off, yeah. but the idea that John was talking about where didn't I pin him against the wall? Which, <laughs> that tactic, number one, is, it is rightful, obviously, but consider the person up against the wall. What's the first reaction when you're pinned down like that? What are you going to do? You're going, to, you're going to come out fighting, and, and all of a sudden, whatever you discuss at that point, it's all for naught. Yeah, that's because a great. Now, now you've done nothing but cause him, cause him to come out uh, even more determined not to do what you Yeah, that's a great way to be introduced to the gospel by being, you know, pushed up against the wall and getting in the fight. You know? yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers. I don't know what happened to that, but uh, okay. Anyways, um, so we'll, we'll finish up this last paragraph here. Uh, Move on. Kind of run out of time. Got 15 minutes. Uh, I thought that the the quote here by C.S. Lewis is interesting. Consider the following quote by C.S. Lewis from his book *Near Christianity*. He says, "The essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. It is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began." Uh, of course, Solomon puts it more simply when he says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before the fall, in Proverbs 16 18. Truly, we must avoid becoming prideful lest we fall, and the only way of doing that is through humility. If you look at humility, it really is kind of the antidote. Those two things are complete op- the antidote. Those two things are really complete opposites. But 
Um, what, what do you think that C.S. Lewis means? It's kind of interesting when he calls pride the essential vice. Why would that be the case? Do you agree with that, disagree with that? Any comments? Brett, you're smiling over there. Well, yeah, because we all, whenever, first of all, when we think of a vice, mm -hmm. a vice is typically in this kind of way, using a negative connotation. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we know what when law enforcement, when those, I don't know if they even use that term anymore, working vice. Mm -hmm. Miami vice. Or the, the <laughs> We you know what? Not, not over here, like LA does though. Yeah, you know, but I mean, a lot of that had to do with, you know, even uh, prostitution, oh, yeah. things like yeah, that, exactly. working vice. But when you say essential vice, there's something in us, and this is what we all have to work on, that we want to save face. We want to justify ourselves. We want to always, you know, again, going back to that, not want to admit that we're wrong. And so I think it's interesting that he uses that kind of terminology uh, when he says, uh, heck, we're in that, it's the very first frame, right? Yeah, the, the, the essential vice, yeah. the utmost evil. Yeah. Um, is because he was pointing out that how man looks at it is this is all about self-preservation of me. And just... And, Making me better. That, and so it becomes, this is what becomes the essential of my life. Yeah. And this is what C.S. Lewis is saying you know what? You, we got to totally dismantle that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And unless that, we let that go, back to what you were saying earlier, we're not willing to confess and admit we're sinners. Well, John and tells essential advice is what rules our life. Well, and we always read what John says, too, you know, if you're not willing to confess your sins and your. <coughs> isn't in you. Well, I always look at that. Why in the world, uh, who, who on earth is going to say they've never done anything wrong? They've never sinned. And uh, I mean, really what it comes down to, it's, it's not that anybody actually believes that, but I think it's what Brent's saying. Everybody wants to save face. You know, we, we don't want to admit that, whether it's before God or uh, before somebody else. We all want to be right in our own eyes. Um, but yeah, it's dangerous and, and it'll, it'll prevent us from being in fellowship with God, is what John tells us. Uh, Matt? Kind of going back to uh, we're talking about clothing yourself yeah. in humility. I don't know if others, to, the, the way I see it is that pride, going back to what we're talking about mm -hmm. now, yeah. we're connected in that um, pride is so dangerous uh, because I think it's one of the few sins where it disguises itself like something else. Like we never, I feel like we could sit here and talk about it, oh, we should be prideful, but we never really realize that we're being prideful <laughs> until like after the fact. And even then, we don't want to, because we're body, we don't look, we don't, we don't want to look back and say we're prideful. <laughs> yeah. And so going back to the clothing yourself, like it's, it's, it's almost like you have to be clothed in it. You always have to be on guard against it because you think about all of the um, social interactions that you have on a daily basis. Like in each one of those interactions, there's a chance for pride to pop up. And it might have been in her Christianity, it might be C.S. Lewis, it might have been someone else. If we lived on an island, we wouldn't be prideful because pride, um, from what I understand, requires another human, two human beings. Like, you're not going to be prideful with, with yourself. It always requires another person so that you can put yourself above that person. Yeah. So I think with every interaction that we have on a daily basis, like, we have to be on guard against it. Mm -hmm. Like, we have to. And I think all the instances I look back, on all arguments that I've had, like, it's always like, well, that person was wrong, or that person was saying this, or it's never my fault, <laughs> it's never my pride, yeah. it's always, it's always them, when in reality, no, it was, it was my pride that was, that was the sin, that was the problem, and I think that's why it's so dangerous. Yeah, um, I, I, I like what you say there at the end, because I remember talking to somebody, and he just, not only did he hate being wrong, that was part of the issue, but he just simply hated when others thought he, wrong, thought he was wrong, even when he knew he was absolutely right. And sometimes something we have to learn to do is being okay with the fact that some people are going to think that we're wrong. I mean, and that's just the reality of the matter because how many arguments have we been in where we both just disagree and neither one of us are willing to say, you know what, if you think I'm wrong, that's okay. I can, I can live with that. I presented what I believe, what my side of the argument is, and I have to live with that. But yeah. I think it's uh, pride is like what he says here, 
probably saw the problem who says it's the first step away from God, right? Mm -hmm. So when we become prideful, that's the first turn away from God. And, and what I have found both in my professional career and personal career is pride does not lead or provide an avenue of, a, of escape for the other person. When, when we're discussing an issue or you think you're right and you become so proud that you don't leave the other person a room for escape to get out of that conversation with their dignity and their yeah. pride, then uh, it's nothing but disaster, right? So no matter how, no matter how right you may be, humility allows you to put yourself in a position to when that other person can escape, you haven't put them in a corner. Yeah. And so that's really what. Yeah, and I think sometimes in those instances, it, it, you, you need to have faith too. I mean, it's kind of this, this seed planting mentality where it's like, okay, like I'm going to give you what the Bible says, and you may disagree with it right now, but it's there, and maybe it'll permeate, and you'll, you know, talk with yourself and work through it on your own. But when you just get in a, you know, a yelling, screaming match with somebody, you're you're really making it hard for that person to want to, you know, come to your side. Well, the other thing too, one other thing is that the other thing that I've always, I've learned over the years too, is that when everything's going right, and you think you're riding the wave high, <laughs> look out because that's the pride right there. Look at the First Corinthians ten twelve, right at the bottom of the right. bulletin. Yeah, yeah. 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 We leave that way of escape. Mm, yeah, no, yeah, exactly. It goes back to exactly the situation that that guy had literally no escape as he's pinned up against the wall there. Yeah, so that's crazy. Yeah, Brett. Yeah, the other thing I was thinking too yeah. is some of these points have been made and just kind of flashed on me because it happens all the time. We intentionally at times, it kind of goes back to something Matt Westbrook said back there. Mm -hmm. I think he's, I think that's true. A lot of times, maybe the pride, we didn't even realize how prideful we were being until after the fact. Yeah. But there are occasions, on the other hand, that we do know what we're doing. And so we try to masquerade it with what? False humility. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing as prideful than false humility. In fact, it's a very common methodology employed by orators, attorneys, politicians. I think a Tertullus that was a hired gun, the Jewish council member, the oh, most noble, you know, this whole thing that he comes across. And it was nothing more than false humility that he was using to try to sway the minds of people. And, and uh, some people do it really well, too. Yeah. And, but, but all they're trying to still do is what? Just elevate themselves and promote self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the thing about that. We have that, to be careful with that. Yeah, we got to be careful with that. And the thing about it is we accept the fact that, you know, if that's something we're doing, we may be able to fool. I may be able to fool Brent with my false humility, but one person I can't fool is God. You haven't yet, but you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, but God won't be mocked, right? And so that's something we definitely, I, I agree with Brent. I mean, again, that's something that, We've all seen. I mean, sometimes it is something you can see, or you can kind of read through it. Um, sometimes it's something we see in ourselves. Sometimes it's something we see in other people. And, and, and not taking away from that point, that's what yeah, I'm saying. No, I think he's right. Many, many times. Watch, yeah. Because there'll be times for my wife, and that's where good wives <laughs> keep you humble, right, Jack? <laughs> right. And, and it'll be, it, it will be a situation, and Vicky will say, we'll be in the car and say, she said, Brent, da 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 yeah. And I'm just going, <laughs> I'm humble. Yes. And, and she said, do you realize how that sounded? Mm -hmm. And it was not my intention. I look back and, you know, think, wow, you're right. You had, she, she served you up a slice of what's at the top of this. Humble page. pie. Humble <laughs> pie. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, what else do I want to cover here? I, I, that's pretty much it. Um, I think that we pretty much explored all the avenues here. I really appreciate the comments. I know I have a lot of questions here. That's kind of how I do things. And I kind of just go for, you know, what, what the flow of the conversation is. And, you know, I typically plan more than what I actually am going to cover. So, um, but yeah, I appreciate all the comments. <coughs> and everything.
and uh, the guys willing us to come out and study. Really, really appreciate it. So, uh, somebody want to lead us in a closing prayer? We have any other? I know I was going to check something and somebody said that you're talking about uh, your brother, of course, obviously, and little shepherd. Do we have any other special uh, prayer requests that need to be brought up before we do that? Then, um, uh, no, just shepherd, right? Is there any uh, other? Well, let's remember, Don is having surgery, a hip right. replacement done on Tuesday. He's got a little thing that they got to check on his records because they saw something that said heart attack in the past. And kind of thinking maybe way in the years when he had the uh, valley fever, yeah. they may be looking at the old record wrong. Yeah. He's got to get that cleared on Monday. But Lord willing, because Don would kind of like get this over with, wouldn't it? But he'll be having surgery on <coughs> Tuesday, Lord willing. <coughs> And uh, as far as also, um, Dennis and Sharon Ross were planning on being right. here, and Sharon Ross's mother was having a real bout uh, with her high blood pressure and feeling quite poorly. They did not want to leave her this morning. Okay. And so, Sharon, I, and I can't remember, anybody remember Sharon's mother's name? Dorothy. Dorothy? Okay. Thank you, boy. Thank you. Remember, <laughs> I, I couldn't remember her name. But. So, Dorothy, Shepard, and then uh, Donna. All right, well, and so I'll, I'll, I'll lead us in a prayer. So I guess the only closing comment I'll have is, you know, it's pride and humility. <laughs> you know, yeah, pride and humility is the antidote, and so it's something that we need to continually uh, work on integrating into our lives. So let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, and thank you for this opportunity that we had to join and come together, Lord, with other like-minded men of this congregation and to uh, gain instruction and guidance and encouragement from your word and also um, uh, the comments of those uh, that are here this afternoon. God, we're so so thankful for that. Uh, Lord, there are many who uh, are in need of prayers at this time. We ask that you please be with uh, baby uh, Shepherd and just help him to um, be a, a healthy boy and please be with uh, mom and dad at this time as well, especially mom as she just gave birth and, and be with her, God. And, um, we also ask that you be with Donnie as he's got a surgery coming up, and we just ask that um, that all that goes smoothly, and and uh, we ask that you please be with the, the doctors and, and the hands of the doctors as they're going to uh, be performing that surgery, and we ask that uh, he makes a smooth recovery and that it's something that uh, that, that really helps him and eases uh, the hip pain, God. Um, we also ask that you please be with uh, Sharon's mother, um, Dorothy, and be with her physical ailments at this time, and if there's opportunities that we have to um, minister uh, to her, Lord, or if there's something we can do there, we ask that you please present those opportunities to us and also help us to uh, take advantage of them, God. Um, we're so thankful, finally, God, for your son, Jesus Christ. Um, we're thankful for the blood of your son and his willingness to, to humble himself and to be obedient, and uh, the fact that he lived this, uh, he walked this entire life uh, knowing that he was the Son of God, uh, but was willing to subject himself to you, uh, and to be obedient to you to the point of death, God. And, uh, because of that, we have the opportunity to be in fellowship with, with you, and we have the opportunity of eternal life, God. And so help us to uh, always uh, have this set before us as our example of humility, Lord, um, if any of us are tempted to be prideful. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.